What we're doing here is a righteous act, gentlemen. You hear me, Gordo? Mm-hmm. You know, there's a Bible verse I think about sometimes. Many times. It goes. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? <clears throat> and I said, here am I, send me. That's Shia LaBeouf from the movie Fury, talking about the mixed feelings that come with being chosen. I thought it was a good fit for my interview with David Ditchfield, who had a rather remarkable near-death experience. I pushed David pretty hard on his Christian interpretation of the experience, but I think we settled on some but I think we settled on some interesting deeper truths about being chosen. Interviewed people, David, who've had multiple near-death experiences and they've said that they've gone deeper on subsequent ones. And the reality that they were at gave way to a deeper reality, and then a deeper reality beyond that. And they even speculate that there's almost no end to how deep or how high, because it's all moving towards the light, moving towards God, moving towards love. How does that strike you? Yes, I do. Because as I said to you, I felt like I was being prepared um, for something to go on to another stage. And I've realized now since my NDE that a lot of my teachings are still coming through now. It's almost like they sent me back and it's kind of, okay, so I'm back here now. But I didn't suddenly feel like, oh man, I don't want to be back here. You know, I, straight away I was thinking, right, I want, what's my purpose? Why have they sent me back? Stay with us for Skeptico. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sikaris, and today we welcome David Ditchfield to Skeptico. He's here to talk about a new book of his called Shine On, an amazing, remarkable near-death experience story that changed David's life in, well, a number of ways that we're going to talk about. You know, we, we don't usually do stories on near-death experience accounts, but David has a lot more to talk about in terms of the near-death experience in general. And also, I think there's some interesting kind of subtle cultural differences between the UK and the US and how we all think about near-death experience. So David, I think we'll have a good discussion. Thanks for joining me today. No, oh, thanks for having me along. Good to meet you, Alex. So I can jump right into the excellent trailer that you guys did for the book. So, oh, cool. <laughs> I thought this is it. David, who, you know, had a near death experience, and that was just very gripping. I remember listening to that and I couldn't turn it off at all. I was really drawn into his experience, and you could hear it in his voice. Okay, so for folks who saw that, I think it's going to be super compelling for folks who are listening, which is the largest part of our audience. <laughs> it probably didn't have as much, except <laughs> there are these amazing images that you do in your uh, painting that we're going to talk more about. And then also that music that all comes about as a result of this remarkable experience. So in words, then tell people what they're hearing in that sure. introduction okay yeah well what i wanted to condense actually into that trailer there was you know the book itself which is a journey which starts off it starts at a point in my life where i was down basically on my luck i was i'd hit hard times and i then we take you from that point to the train accident that i had that should have taken my life but didn't and then the near-death experience, and then coming out of that, coming through the other side of all that, and suddenly being compelled to, to want to paint huge canvases like I'd never done before in my life, and then going from that to want to write classical music, which I'd also never done. And all these 
things came about because I felt this um, strong urge to really want to be able to tell everyone what I'd seen and what I'd been through. You know, I just felt and still feel it's it's a very important message to get across. So yeah, that's that's in a nutshell the kind of it's a journey if you like. So it's taking you from that journey of, of darkness at the beginning has to be said because that's where I was at, and coming out the other side and coming into like this, you know, a, a beautiful, more colourful and three dimensional way of living. You know, so there, there's kind of a lot to that. You know, as I kind of alluded to on this show, we've kind of explored a lot of different of the aspects of near death experience, kind of more from a scientific standpoint. Mm. And, and that's not to lessen the significance of anyone's story, but more as a way to kind of lead us into someone's story. Because your account is mm. is remarkable because you're just kind of a, a guy there who's in London, who's a very expensive place to live, and you're having trouble making it, doing labor stuff and building tree houses and doing that stuff. And you go say goodbye to your girlfriend on the train and you go to step back from the train and your coat is caught in the, in the That's train, right. which is yeah. quite unbelievable to think how that could happen, but it does. And you, yeah. you should die. I mean, from what happens, you're dragged down the tracks, you're thrown under the train, you should die by all accounts. But instead, <laughs> you, what happens is what we hear so often in your experience, you're thrown outside of your body, you have this amazing experience. And then as you say, you have a transformation afterwards that changes your life in some significant way. So it is a remarkable story in all those uh, respects. You know, one of the things that you deal with in your book, I guess, is kind of this interplay between two different groups. I thought this was an interesting interplay. These two different groups that are kind of advising you. And one are these folks from the spiritualist church, which are guiding you in this kind of profound way. And the other is this very materialistic kind of psychological, you're going to see a therapist. And she's coming at it from a very grounded kind of, I don't really know if I believe this, but I'll just go (laughs) off of that. Well, what did you see is that in your personal life, what do you, what did you, how did you experience that tension between the kind of spiritualist church perspective and the psychiatrist perspective? Well, both are absolutely relevant uh, to me at the time. And in, in as much as obviously I'd had to deal with uh, quite a uh, horrific accident, you know, going under a train and facing life, uh, sorry, death in the eyes is very traumatic. So I had to deal with all that. That's why I had those sessions. But at the same time, I was being helped by the spiritualist church, uh, I was going to spiritual healing, and I found that to be really quite remarkable. It, it was helping me to heal both physically and mentally, and and I know that that was challenging to to people in the medical profession, i.e., the, the the therapist, because I knew that she was kind of like it was kind of the gears were grinding a bit for her because I kept talking about my spiritual aspects. And I, could, I felt that she was trying to close me down on that. So yes, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but I knew that she was in, that she, was, she couldn't deny what I was talking about. It was actually something quite strong and powerful. And so in terms of science you're talking about, you know, I, I've, I've been in, in conversations with scientists well, via interviews like this, and, and I found it to be really okay, you know, because, I mean, for me, we need science. I wouldn't still be here now without the scientists, like, i.e. the doctors and the consultants that saved me and put me back together, you know. So we need the balance of two in our lives. So that's how I see it with those two aspects that, that I found that I was benefiting from both. And I never found that there was a, personally for me, that there was a kind of a jarring sort of, of the gears, as I put it. So yeah, both are really relevant. Yeah, I just think there's there's a lot of different ways to take that. One of the things I felt again and again in the book is kind of this cultural difference that I don't know if a lot of people pick up on, but you're probably in a good position to talk to it because as part of the book, Shine On, you've now done a number of interviews with people in the U.S. as well as in the U.K. And there seems to be, we seem to have a kind of a different take on it. People in the U.S. seem to be much more open to the spiritual light and love stuff. And in the UK, it seems like we're still having to kind of 
tell the story. This is real. Please believe me. You know, and <laughs> we did an interview with the woman from the Guardian and she's like, wow, I probably don't really believe you. And I'm really afraid of death. So tell, tell me the story from that standpoint. And I, I just wonder if you see those, how you see those differences in our two cultures around yeah, there's, there's a massive uh, change, most certainly talking to US people. It's, I don't know what it is. It's just, I guess it's, it's, it's like, it's a very cultural thing, that, you know, that the, the British are very, you know, sort of stiff upper lip and, you know, we almost like stuck in Victorian times still very, we don't get in touch with emotions. And it's, it's almost like, yes, okay, let's, um, you know, th- th- there's many a times that I'd speak to people here. I mean, for example, when I was in hospital, I remember, I wanted to speak to uh, like the uh, like the priest that, that that was in the hospital itself and I was dying to speak to him because I thought oh, he's got to get this story straight away. And he was a lovely guy, but I felt that he was like kind of closing me down as if to say, "Okay, David, that's enough. Let's say a prayer for you." But I thought and that was so very British whereas yes, when I would speak to people in the US, they're a lot more wanting to sort of uh, listen and, and absorb more of it and they're not too quick to sort of judge on it. But again, going back to what I was just talking about earlier, it's, it's it's good to have both elements because in saying that, I've spoken to, I've done interviews here. I, I remember doing an interview on a, on a like a drive time show here. And the, this guy came on and he got me on the show and I could hear him talking just before the commercial break. And I thought, this is all wrong. It's not going to work. And it was one of the very first interviews that I did. I thought, he's just not going to get this. And so, yeah, he kind of went, yeah, come on then, you know, tell us the story. So I started telling it. And by the time I'd finished it, he was going, look, I've got to stop you because we're going to the news break, but this is great. I want to come back to this. And it was like, it made me realize that people can deny it as much as they like, but at the end of the day, it's, it's that thing that I realized that none of us actually think about death at all. It's a strange thing that none of us do. None of us want to go there, but it's not like I think we should be talking about it every day over our breakfast cereal. It's just that we should actually talk about it more because it's inevitable. It's all going to happen to us at one point. You know, we may as well talk about it and think about it and, and the fear element will go away. And so, so maybe in the U S a lot more people are going to be a lot more open to, to that point. And when that happens, when that point of death comes, that they'll be less scared, less fearful. Maybe, although, you know, there's a couple other ways to pull apart those cultural differences. Like one of the things I see is it seems to me that people in the UK have kind of bought into the atheistic kind of scientism stuff that some folks in the US have kind of gotten to the other side of and said, hey, that's probably not the whole story. We are not just biological robots in a, hum- in a meaningless universe. There's something more to this story versus I still, when I talk to people in the UK, they, they're unapologetic about, well, of course, I'm, of course I'm atheist. Of course, science explains everything. And you're like, oh, you haven't maybe kept up on the research there. And the same thing, like when I heard your therapist say, okay, you know, I, David, to be honest with you, I first investigated your NDE and I know about I think she even said MDMA re- receptors in the brain and all this stuff, which is like outdated, out completely yeah, yeah. Dis- dismissed science as it comes to near-death experience. So I-, I wonder if that just hasn't penetrated to a certain extent. But then you also on the flip side of that, so you guys are atheistic in kind of a mind-numbing way. And then, of course, in the U.S., they're Christian in a mind-numbing kind of way where it's, hey, it has to be this one way and that's the only way we could ever understand it that has its that has its limitations too there's a lot of people who aren't actually atheists as a, who are you know but it's mainly sort of christian and church of england as we call it all catholic and i think which a is a whole people, mess there that we could get into you know the whole... exactly because it's a it's a faith that hasn't changed over over decades or centuries so i mean it's remained the same and there's no budging so there's no sort of like leeway you know as i talked about the priest in the hospital it's almost like his it was like a robot who's at the steam is about to start coming out his ears and then i can't i can't comprehend this this is wrong you know (laughs) i think in turn we can't understand it in terms of he can't process it and then i think at this other level that we're not even aware of 
we can't process why he can't process it, if you know what I mean. Like, I get the sense that you weren't a super religious guy beforehand, but you had a sense that if you went to a priest, he would have some answer. And then when he doesn't, that kind of throws you for a loop like, but aren't you supposed to be interested in this? What is really maybe going on? Exactly. That's exactly how I felt. You know, it wasn't like I was going there for sort of um, confirmation on what happened. It was like, I just thought, wow, you, you, you guys will want to hear this because it's part of your, I'm sure it's part of your faith. But then I realized afterwards that it's not that in fact that the afterlife is not really discussed that much in, in most of the British uh, faiths. It's apart from Jesus and Christ and, you know, and, um, you know, the, the resurrection but they, nobody really talks about what happens to, to us our souls when we when we go you know it's all so yeah so it's a, a very different sort of uh lockdown sort of faith in, if you like yeah but hey ho i mean that a lot of, I, I don't like to knock people who do have a faith because I, the, most of them are really lovely people you know i mean there's, there's been times i've gone into churches since you know and i've seen well they're really good you know they're really good kind-hearted souls and giving but if only they would just you know, if only I could just walk in and just do one talk to them all in in the congregation and just chat, not to try and convert them or anything like that, because that's definitely not not what I'm about. You know, I, I don't want to convert anybody. You know, I just I just want to talk about what I saw and what I experienced because it's such a beautiful thing that awaits us all. You know, that, that I feel and can only help us overcome this um, stigma of um, the idea of death. You know, one of the cool things that I think the Brits do have is this, the spiritualist church tradition. And we Mm. have it here in the U.S., but it's like way, uh, very, very uh, small and not talked about much. And you stumble into a spiritualist church early on, before the NDE, right? Don't you go there for... uh, That's right, yeah. Yeah, I was, because I was traveling up to see my sister. She she invited me up for, for the weekend. And I was on the train and I bumped into an elderly couple sat opposite me. And we got chatting. They were wanted to know where the next station was and things. And uh, then this lady turned around to me and said, look, we're going to see a medium. And I went, oh, okay. And I just didn't want to get involved in the conversation. I was kind of like, was in my own at that point. I just wanted to like just be myself. But she kept coming back and chatting to me. And she, she, she said, she handed me a flyer, like a small poster as she got off the train with the details for this thing on so i thought okay so i just put it in my pocket and forgot all about it and i remember getting to my sister's and the family were all doing their own thing and my sister was cooking and stuff so i thought do you know what i'm gonna go i'm gonna go to this thing and see what it's about so i went and it was packed it was like a small church and and i sat down and everyone was going there trying to get messages from loved ones who just passed over you know and so it was all things like yeah i'm picking up your grandfather he's got a watch here is that right and and people it was amazing they were like bang on you know and i got no reason to go at all i wasn't looking for a message but she turned around this medium she's very animated she just stopped and she went man in the blue jumper i've got a message for you and i went oh okay and she said your life is about to change they're telling me it's about to change it's going to be big be ready for it and I said, oh, in what way is it going to change? I was thinking, wow, you know, is, this, is the money going to start coming in there? You know, is it, <laughs> all these different things. She said, they're not telling me, but you'll be protected. And that was it. And so I went off thinking that, you know, I, at that point I was looking for a relationship to start with somebody. And it, never, it never came in at all. Nothing, none of those things happened. But then I realized that after my NDE, that's what it was about. That's what that message was for. So I was keen to try and find that church again. Because I thought those people will probably want to hear about it, you know, and they did. As soon as I walked in there and found it, they just wanted to hear that, you know, they took it straight on. It's like they knew about it. They're going, yeah, 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 yeah. Near death experience. Yeah, we've heard of those. <laughs> they had heard about yours, David, because it was all over the news it there, right? Indeed, it was so yeah. dramatic <laughs> that it, um, the, everyone rides the train, everyone, and that's their worst fear is <laughs> being caught exactly. in the doors. I know. I couldn't believe it. You know, I was lying in hospital, you know, and my, my surgeon was coming in each day and he was going, Oh, you're in the Guardian today. You're in, you know, you're in the Times. And I was going, what? You know, and then the, then the TV guys wanted to come and interview me and, and like, uh, it, it all got like, really crazy you know and uh, and I, I thought it, I found it so amusing because I was 
it was keeping me going. It was really enjoyable. And I was in this hospital room, you know, unable to move. But I'm thinking, this is brilliant, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. The spiritualist church thing. I mean, like, that's the stuff I'm so interested in. And, and you are too. And, and you go back to them and you have some amazing healing experiences. And I'm going to show people one of the quotes I had from the book. And I'm going to put it up on the screen if anyone's watching. They can see this amazing artwork that you've done. And again, keep in mind when people go and look at this, this is something you never had any inclination for, no experience, no training in. And you come out and you start doing these large pieces that just one in a million could could kind of produce this stuff. But here's the quote. I thought this was amazing from, you can tell me who it's from, but it was a woman who did a healing session for you at the Spiritualist Church. It's essential to understand that spirit doesn't show up here except through us. Ultimately, it must come through us to manifest in the world. That's why it's so easy for us to create hell in this life. Terrible things are happening right now, everywhere around us, but hell exists here on earth only because people are still working out the hell within themselves. Talk for a minute about this healing session, and if you want to, about that quote. Yeah, well, Joy is the healer, and she's amazing because a lot of the stuff that she told me, like, for example, that, she would also tell me afterwards that that came through by a spirit because I would be in the healing session. It's a really beautiful, peaceful place. It's almost like a meditative state, and you're sat there, and it's kind of like a hands-on healing, just on starting on you know, your shoulders, working around your body. And the healers, are, they, they're like guides. They're sort of like, sorry, they're not guides. They draw into their guides, and their guides send through the healing energy through their hands and through in a meditative form as well. So she was picking up an awful lot of stuff, and it was, like, it was almost like tram transmissions from the other side, all these messages that were just like really profound, and which is really incredible because she, when I speak to her, say, just before it session, she didn't come across as like a, a, a very profound person. So it was, you could tell that a lot of it was definitely coming from somewhere else. And so I learned an awful lot from her because I learned a, an awful lot about, and it all tied in with my near-death experience as well because I, I, what I'd learned from the experience all made sense. So it was kind of like, there was a, almost like these kind of like moments of affirmation, but also making me go, ah, oh, yeah, that's what happened there. That's why that happened. So, you know, I mean, I, maybe I should talk you through the near-death experience itself and, and chat about what happened there. It, it might help to explain a bit more. Sure, please do, David, whatever you think. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, basically what, what happened to me was I, I was, it was at the point I, the, where the paramedics had rushed me into hospital from picking me up off the rail track and the, uh, and we had arrived in the hospital. And I remember seeing like there was a whole team of um, you know surgeons and, and doctors and nurses all waiting for me. It looked like this big semicircle. And in I went. And they were rushing around. I was losing copious amounts of blood at that point. And they were running around just trying to save me. And I remember my family had come in as well. They were there so quick. And I remember they were all chatting around me and my family. And they were, my mother was in tears. You know, everyone was totally distressed. So it was a very stressful scenario. And then I suddenly went from that place to a really beautiful sort of like, I thought it was a darkened room at first. It was like a really comforting place. It felt like a darkened room, but, and I was just lay there and I suddenly, all the pain had gone, all the noise overload and sound overload had disappeared. And I was just this silence. And then there was these beautiful orbs that were like, kind of like pulsating all around me, all different colors, like ambers and greens and yellows. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> and um, I just laid my head back and I realized that I was laid on what was like a huge sort of slate rock, if you like. It was almost like, a, like an altar, it was like a medieval altar or something, you know. And, but it felt very comfortable to be laid on this. You're in your NDE, but what was your vantage point? How were you looking at it? Yeah, yeah, I was in my body because uh, that was one of the th first things that I did was that I realized where I was. I suddenly looked at my body to see how it was looking and all the wounds healed 
I could just see, I was just covered in like a blue cloth. So there's no clothing on me. There was just like this blue, beautiful sort of satin sort of sheet that was like really cool, but comforting. And I looked down and, and my everything, all the cuts and bruises and rips and everything had, had, had healed. You know, my left arm had been severed in, in the accident and that was, that was still back in place. So I, was, I definitely felt I, like I was in my body. And uh, so it was like me in, in another, in this dimension, which I believed was actually that I died. I thought, this is it. I passed on. This is, I'm hit, that's over. Here I am in the next phase. But I, I had no sense of fear or anguish about it. I actually felt so comfortable there that I, I accepted it readily. But it was at that point that I felt there was a, a presence with me you know and you know you sense someone's just behind you or whatever you think you look you know but this wasn't behind me it was a, it was like an androgynous being a beautiful being this was stood at, at my right feet and just staring at me and the odd thing is is that this being i call it like a being of light because it was like had this beautiful blonde white hair but the skin was like sort of like glowing and the expression on on the, the being's face was like like it's beautiful, almost like on like a knowing smile, like like I'd known this person throughout my whole life, or or in fact beyond that, you know, it was like a soulmate, I guess. And I felt that I was being cared for and protected, and I thought, well, this is really quite amazing. So I just kind of laid my head back, and then I looked up and I saw like three grids of uh, pure white light above me, and and I remember lying there looking into that light, and I just couldn't take my gaze away. Normally, it'd be the kind of bright white light that you wouldn't be able to look into, like an electric fluorescent strip or, or the sunlight even, you know. But I kept looking at this, and it just felt like it was healing me. And I felt all this energy coming from that light. And I just thought, this is really beautiful. And then I suddenly then was aware of um, two other beings either side of me, and two female form. One of them was white Caucasian, I guess, and the other one was Asian American Indian. And, uh, and they, were, they, they had their hands kind of like hovering very slowly over my body. And I felt this sensation that they were healing me. It was almost like a, a form of uh, Reiki or, or spiritual healing, in fact, which I'd never had, obviously, until that point, you know. And, but the energy that was coming from all three of these beings was just like pure love. It was just like this energy of, I don't know, like a compressed love of all the different types of love you experience in your life, whether it's from through your lover or your mother, your father, or even your pet cat like you've got, you know, <laughs> and it's all those types of love all condensed, and uh, it was just amazing. And I, it, it was like a, a form of love that was just like I could feel it running through me, through my whole, throughout my whole being, and uh, it was. Uh, I felt at that point that I was being prepared almost for something. I thought, some, what are they doing? What's going on here? And I felt like I must be getting ready to go on to the next stage of something, you know. And, and then I um, suddenly thought about my family because, as I said earlier, I knew that they were all frantically sort of looking over me in the hospital, in the, in the emergency department. So I thought, I wonder how they're doing. <laughs> and so I kind of figured I'd, if I looked over the edge of this kind of like huge rock that I would see them. But I didn't see them. But what I did see was this most amazing sight. It was like a, it was like a huge waterfall of stars that, that, that was curving around in a huge curve and all these stars were just like cascading down and they were just sparkling into this beautiful sort of like sort of this you know like it was just and i looked down and it seemed to they seemed to be disappearing into other galaxies and other dimensions and it was just so spectacular and then there were beautiful colors as i looked down further and and it's quite interesting because some of the i've been hubble have been uh putting up all these photographs uh, quite recently of, of new parts of the universe they've never seen before. And it's amazing because the, it's almost like what, it's, what I saw in my NDE, which is amazing because I also started painting what I saw in, the, in my NDE. And I've had, I had friends phoning me up, two of them this week said, have you seen the new Hubble things? It's, it's your paintings. And I go, I know it's, it's, um, it's incredible. So anyhow, sorry, I digress there, but I just had to put that in because it was just, Again, a, a moment of affirmation. But well, there, there's so many, there's so many jumping off points there that it, 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 it's tough because, and that's where I guess the, I don't want to use the term science and kind of take people in the wrong direction, but to try and organize what you're saying 
there's so many different parts of it, I don't quite know where to begin. One would be tying back to the synchronicity of meeting somebody on the train, them handing you a brochure, you having no interest in it, but you go. I mean, that's strange. You being picked out of the crowd and being given a message, that's strange. The message you're given is just, uh, it's just too crazy to almost believe. It sounds like a made up story, you know? Your life is gonna change, but you're gonna be okay, you're protected. And then you, you go through this incredible life-changing experience that should kill you by all accounts. Yeah. And you're protected. What is, what is your understanding at this point? And you talk about this in the book, but let's talk about it here. What's your understanding of fate, of mm. our life being predetermined, free will? All those things, are, they're, they're somewhat irreconcilable even within your story, but how are you understanding some of those things now? Well, since all this has happened, my take on it is, is that we have, it's like our, uh, our lives are predestined probably before we're actually born into this world. And the way I see it, it's almost like a, it's like a highway. And that's, that's, our, that's our map, our roadmap, you know. And we're all tempted to take routes off that highway that, that we think that's going to be the road that's going to lead us to freedom and happiness and, you know, all, all the riches we want. But we go down those roads and then they are not the ones for us. And I took too many of those roads, I think, on my journey. And my take on it is, is that I've, I feel that I'd hit such a low point in my life. You know, it was like the dark night of the soul, if you like, that I'd gone in so deep that the only way I was going to come out of this was for something very dramatic to happen, like that train accident. And that everything was predestined to lead me towards that point. Hold, hold on though, David, because don't you see, I mean, there's kind of an implicit contradiction in what you just said. Number one, we need to understand what those deep, dark things are. I don't know, you must know some really horrible things, because it doesn't sound like it from all accounts, other than playing in a punk rock band, which I don't even know if there's anything wrong with that. But I don't know, no, no. maybe you do have some really, maybe you're doing satanic stuff in the basement or something. No, no, I, no, no. I don't know. <laughs> no, no. Why is there the need for redemption? If you're on your path, why does the path need to change? Why does the healing need to take place? Why are they doing anything? That would be the question, right? Like, if it all is just an experience, why do anything? Why does the Native American, Asian a person have to get together and do some heavy duty Reiki on you to put you back? To, why, why, why? Because, because I was destroying myself. I wasn't, I wasn't doing any dark sort of uh, stuff. It was just, the darkness was just um, my depression. I was drinking too much. I was drinking heavily and that was just taking me right down. And, you know, I was beating myself up big time. And so it was just, what I'm trying to say is, is that, that they felt, right, okay, this, he's not a bad guy. This guy needs to be pulled out of this mess that he's got himself into. And it was just pulling me out of that and, and bringing me back onto the track that, I, that was meant for me, which I feel now I'm back on that, on that highway and I follow it now. You know, and I'm, I'm not really tempted by too many of those, those roads that are saying, hey, come and take this road. You know? So that's what I'm trying to say. So it's, 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 you know the phrase, dark night of the soul? Have you not heard that phrase at all? Then? Absolutely. And I love the way you put it. Let me, let me read another okay. quote from the book that gets to this. And to remember that we live in a universe that offers redemption. Perhaps that was the purpose of the message. And I think that's what you're talking about. You're talking about a redemption yeah. story. But the art piece that goes with this is a very Jesus-looking figure is, with yeah. almost a UFO-looking kind of thing <laughs> over his head. So yeah. talk about redemption, because that's what we're talking about. Basically, as you rightly pointed out, I wasn't really, I didn't follow any faith or Christianity or anything like that. It wasn't, it wasn't at all in my life. But what happened next in my NDE was when I turned over after looking at that waterfall of stars, I suddenly felt there was an even more powerful energy that was, that was around me. And, and that's when I looked and saw this huge tunnel of white light coming towards me. And it was just slowly coming in. And this tunnel of white light was just like surrounded by all these kind of like, slowly circulating flames of yellows and reds and 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 what have you and and 
I the energy had coming off that it was like it just turned the dial at big time. I could feel it like pulsating through every molecule in my body, and I just straight away thought that is that is God. That's the energy of all creation. That's where it's all coming from, from this tunnel of white light with all the flames. It's not the the Michelangelo sort of Vatican ceiling image of God with the beard putting his hand out. That is it. So for me, it's I now have that. I, that's my faith. But it's it's and that Jesus coming into the fold there. That happened because when I started going for the spiritual healing sessions, one of the sessions I had, I was lying there and I had for no reason at all. I had this image of Christ there looking at me while I was being healed and I thought nothing of it and then right at the end Joy the healer turned around and said you know you had Christ stood next to you there I was going what so you know so I thought this was just too much so I've got to paint that so that's what I painted I painted him and that's him sort of floating above the river which is near where I live and uh, and I wanted to paint Christ not in the usual form that we see him, which is hanging off a cross, which is the worst part of his life. I thought, let's paint him, you know, looking healthy and happy, which is how I saw him. And I also wanted to give him, I looked at all halos and all, all the different sort of Renaissance paintings that, are, that Christ is given. And they're just like this little fine white circle. I thought, no, I want to give him this like incredible halo because, you know, it's a, it's a powerful image. And it's, I incorporated some of the images that I was getting through from those healing sessions into that halo. And yes, there's been quite a lot of um, UFO interpretations <laughs> put in there, but you know what? It's, it's okay because I want that painting to sort of make people stop and look. I don't want it just to be an image of Christ and oh, there's Christ. I want people to think about it and chat about it. Yeah. One of the things I think is really interesting about that. And we've had this ongoing discussion about it. Like, the Christ consciousness thing to me is an undeniable part of the near-death experience in that it comes through again and again. If you go to the researchers, they go, hey, this is undeniable. Christ seems to be coming through. When we look at Jesus historically, he slips through our fingers. There's a good chance that he doesn't exist, certainly in the form that he's portrayed in the Bible and in these other things. He doesn't exist. Now, I personally, David, don't have a problem with that. I am open to the idea that we do and can manifest everything. But other mm. people have a very literal, historical interpretation of that. I wonder if you've given that any thought. And what do you think if, if someone was able to kind of lay out a bunch of biblical, historical, archaeological kind of stuff and say, wow, you know, the Jesus figure doesn't, doesn't really add up. What does that mean? Does that mean anything to you? Well, the, the way I, I, my take on it is this, and that is that he was around, obviously, at the time of the, the Romans, and, and we never question for one minute that if we have a history lesson on Caesar or, or Pontius Pilate, that all those guys existed. And we think, yeah, they existed. And we see paintings of them, and it's like, yeah, they existed in history. We don't question it. Whereas with Jesus, there's this kind of thing, well, maybe he didn't exist, you know, but... You know, but we do question it. See, I mean, if you really look into it, like when you said the, the history stuff, like yeah. I'll, I'll just give you a small example. Like most of the history that Christians go to to say that Jesus is historical is they go to Josephus because Josephus was a Roman historian. Yeah. But, but there's no record of Jesus in there. The one record we have is fake. And then Josephus's writings wind up in the gospel in a very pro-Roman kind of reverse engineered way. I, I, I'm just saying historically, no, there's Jesus doesn't, doesn't hold up. It's just like Satan. Satan completely slips through your fingers when you go back and look at, you know, the very early Judaic texts of Yahweh, the thunder God. There's no Satan in there. And then the same <laughs> stories are repeated afterwards. Well, and maybe Satan, on the Satan. <laughs> Satan is introduced. Well, you can't. You can't take one or the other. If we take your near-death experience literally mm. as that you were in this dimension and these things really happened, yeah. well, then we have a conflict with thousands of other near-death experiences that look completely different. I interviewed a guy, Dr. Gregory Shushan, who's done this cross-cultural analysis of near-death experiences. For me, and I'm a spiritual believer, mm -hmm. I look at the similarities. But if you step back, you can also look at the differences and say, well, well, no one's right. The people who just see 
who see Jesus and believe it's Jesus of this cross thing, well, they can't possibly be right because this isn't possibly right. They, there is conflict, conflicts. But if Jesus didn't actually exist, let's face it, Christianity would have, would have died out and faded years ago. But it didn't. It just stayed around and it just grew. And it's just, it's just you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to sort of like say, hey, you know, Christianity, I'm not trying to defend Christianity, but I'm just trying to say that I can't imagine that it would still be around now if, if this guy was just a myth. Uh, but you David, know. it's the opposite of that. If we understand Christianity the way we did, like at the beginning of the show, if we understand it as a social engineering mind control project, which it is, I mean, the Catholic Church, look at it now. I mean, it's completely discredited in most people's minds. It yeah. is not an institution that's, it was the church for the longest time, right? Mm. If you go back to the beginning, it was always about controlling the people. If you look at Constantine, when he first establishes a church in 412, he brings in the feudal system and it turns everyone into slaves. You can no longer own property. It's a control mechanism in the same way that it's being used today. And then, you know, people who are more spiritually minded say, well, don't worry about that. You know, look hmm. for this or look for that. Well, you can, but you also have yeah. to consider the other aspects of it. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> well, that, well, of course, yeah, that, that, you have to consider the other aspects of it. I mean, I mean, that was one of the things I was very keen to do when I first started writing the book. I spoke to my co-writer and, and she's, she was able, she said, look, why don't you contact the hospital and find out, you know, all the, the medication you were on at the time and how that may have affected you, whether it had been a mind-bending drug and all those different things. So we went through all that and we discovered that because she's got she's uh, basically she, she was lecturing in nursing so she knew what she was talking about she knew her stuff she was qualified and so we she said yeah i've been through everything and yes there were drugs that you were given that that could have been hallucinated but they were given afterwards you know not before you had your nde and and the other thing is as well just going back to the to, to what you're talking about and that is that there's been studies in people who have ndes and the difference being is is you know there's there's a lot of um intense real consistency to their near-death experiences you know like mine stayed with me and it's as clear to me now as it was then because it was real it wasn't like a dream i know it wasn't a dream i know it wasn't a hallucination you know I, you know it's 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 a totally different thing whereas like people who are in dream states or what have you they the they 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 go within minutes. And not only that, that you know, when they tell the same dream again, it's changed. It's like, oh, hang on a sec. I thought you said a guy with blue hair walked in, and now you're saying it's you know pink and stuff. You know, it's it's a very different thing. So, and I don't think that most people who have had NDEs would be bothered to sort of just be talking about it like I am now as much because it's also a thing that for me, as I said earlier, I don't particularly want to sort of be trying to convert people saying, listen to me, this is you know, and it's 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 more you know it, this is what happened this is what i saw and and, it, and it's 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 this we we can't assume just because we were a scientist and we've got brilliant minds and we have a lot of us have that that that's it we've nailed it we, we know the answers because a and b equals you know x or whatever i David, mean like, I'm, I'm totally with you but but here's the rub i have with that you can't do what you said, do the scientism thing, which I'm rail against every week. Mm -hmm. But you can't also say my experience trumps everyone else's experience. You can't say because I had this experience and it's so important to me, I hold that dearly and that can be the only truth. And in that sense, that's the advantage of looking at near-death experiences across the board. Mm -hmm. Like I told you, there's nothing kind of more offensive to me than fundamentalist Christians who co-opt the near-death experience for their religion and want to shut everyone else out and say all the genuine near-death experiences have Jesus and have all the rest of this. And if you didn't have those, then your experience is somehow lesser or something. I, yeah. I, to me, I, I don't know how you get there. So what I'm interested in doing is climbing on top of those experiences, letting loose of them a little bit and seeing that okay, you had a realer than real experience that I accept from my research is closer to the ultimate reality than this bullshit we're talking about here. But I would suggest to you that it's possible that that, that experience is still an abstraction of a more 
ultimate reality, you know, and that in that realm, you're still, that's the only way I can explain it, that you're still interpreting and, you know, creating a reality in that extended reality. Do, do you think that has any possibility of being true? Or do you think where you were is the ultimate reality? Yeah, it was the ultimate reality. I know that to be the case. There's I, nothing I, else. Never, there's nothing else beyond that. It's, I've never, I've never questioned that it, where I was wasn't was a, you know a, some kind of dream or state. It was, it was real. But the other thing is, I, I think as well is, is that we can do all the science in, in the world we can, but you know we don't understand the soul. We don't understand, you know, no scientist can turn around and actually come up with an equation as to why we feel love you know, and what brings two souls together to collide and fall in love, you know, there's, there's, and, and it's, it's the same thing. I mean, the soul is such a powerful thing. And, the, and my take on it now is, is that, that death is not the end, that the soul lives on. Yes. Yes. The actual body that we're walking around in that, that decays and that dies off, but our souls live on and where they go to, I'm not sure, but I just know that, that the soul lives on and that's exactly where, the state that I was, I feel lucky enough to have been into, to have a look into that and say, right, this is what happens next. Our souls live on. And of course, every account that you say that you've interviewed with other people has varied. I'm aware of that because since my near death experience, it was one of the first things I wanted to do was to like, sort of look around, you know, I went straight onto the internet as soon as I could to find that when I got home to say, right, let's have, to have a look into this. One of the, one of the best ones I saw actually was from it was a, a young child I think she must have been about five years old and she'd had a near death experience and uh, she painted it and it was unbelievable because it was it was just like a, a matchstick sort of version of my painting that you put up earlier it was like her lying on the square well lying on the square table actually but she got three different individual people with their hands out with like these stick hands going over her body. Then this square, which is like a blue square over her body, which is clearly the blue cloth. And then it looked like what was like an ice cream cone sort of like flying through the sky towards her. And I thought, wow. And that stayed with me because that blew me away. Cause I just thought, there you go. It's like that. She, she went there, her, her soul passed over onto the other side, but she, she came back, you know, so it's, I've um, interviewed people, David, who've had multiple near death experiences and they've said that they've gone deeper and subsequent ones and that yeah. they're the reality that they were at gave way to a deeper reality and then a deeper reality beyond that. And they even speculate that there's almost no end to how deep or how high, because it's all moving towards the light, moving towards God, moving towards love. How does that strike you? Yes, I do. Because as I said to you, I felt like I was being prepared um, for something to go on to a, another stage, and which I didn't do. But I've realized now since my NDE that a lot of my teachings are still coming through now. It's almost like they sent me back and it's kind of okay. So I'm back here now. But I didn't suddenly feel like, oh man, I don't want to be back here. You know, I, straight away I was thinking, right, I want, what's my purpose? Why have they sent me back? And I'm still sort of searching for those answers. And so I feel like I'm still getting teachings, thankfully through, through the likes of joy and through the healing. But not only that, I've also learned to channel with my guides to, to communicate with them. And they, they've helped me do those paintings. They've helped me have the confidence to actually say, I'm going to write a piece of music for an orchestra. And, and not only that, that very first piece of music that I wrote and was performed by an orchestra, sold out the concert sold out two weeks in advance which was for the orchestra itself were unheard of they were really couldn't believe it um i mean in all, fa in all fairness it was the media build-up you know it was good you know the local bbc tv guys came down and stuff but but it i felt again that i was being held i felt like these guys from the other side i still felt like i was attached like a, like there was a cord that was still pulling me back up there you know and they were helping me and they they helped all that come together and for it to be a really wonderful events and a, a packed out audience you know the atmosphere was just so beautiful in there that night and it was just like yeah you know i just feel like they're, they're with me and they're still that i was sent back here to, to continue with the work here but i also get it that other people because obviously i've read about other people's ndes that they do go to different dimensions and they they get all sorts of teachings you know they, they're educated further through those the deeper sort of dimensions that they go into so yeah i believe that, that 
that that is it we don't you know i we don't just hit the stage where i'm at i went to and that's it the, you know it'll, it'll be different dimensions that's awesome david and i think that is consistent with your story and with your life and you mentioned that pretty early on i mean i think one of the ways that we can judge the veracity of these stories is by looking at the people and your life is a testament to your story and what you've learned. Not so much like a, a preachy thing because you're not a preachy guy. It's more a testament to real spiritual transformation. So this book of yours, Shine On, it's gotten some great press. You've got a great publisher who's really behind it. How's that all going for you? And where do you go after this? Are you going to write another book? Or I guess you're open to being led wherever you be wherever you're led huh you just said that yeah exactly it's uh at the moment it, it is being led a bit like that concert i feel like they're they're with me the energy is really helping me and lifting me along and you know when we're getting getting to talk to, to people you know like yourself which is great and it's like it's getting me out there and it's getting the message more global now i'm just sitting down and doing these interviews and um and the energy of the book feels great in terms of you know being helped with its promotion which is fantastic and i i'm not really thinking beyond this stage at the moment you know the book's coming out in june so i'm just kind of all just putting all my energies towards getting that and hoping that i can get it to, to you know to stay afloat and then go out to sea happily and then i can think about what comes next but as you said yeah i'll be guided you know i, I know i'm actually writing a new piece of music at the moment so that's been going on for a while which is cool. I wasn't expecting this. And so that's coming together really nicely. So I know that that will probably be the next stage because I want, I want to keep the, the music and the artwork coming. I mean, so that's, it all, it all carries on. It's just like a continuous, it's like a little industry <laughs> at the moment. Well, so, yeah. it, it's awesome. It's, it's, it's a pretty high order industry. So that's, <laughs> it's been awesome getting to know you and thanks for joining me. Best of luck with all this work. Thank you so much. It's been great chatting with you, Alex. It's really great questions. Thanks again to David Ditchfield for joining me today on Skeptico. I have a level three kind of question to tee up for you. Is there something beyond the Christian near-death experience? And if there is something beyond it, then can it really be called a Christian near-death experience? I think you understand what I'm getting at, especially if you've listened to a lot of these shows. I've kind of found it on this topic a lot. But I'd love to hear your thoughts about it. Drop me a note or come over and join others on the Skeptical Forum. Tell me what you think. I'm delighted to see that a few of you are doing that. I wish even more of you would, but if you, for some reason you don't or you can't, know that you're still part of this conversation just by listening to it and giving us the opportunity to connect in this magic way that is podcasting. So thanks for listening. I have some, I just think they're really good shows coming up. I hope you'll stick with me for all of that. Until next time, take care and bye for now. <laughs>